In this video, I'd like to start introducing the second big tool for cybernetic patching, which is the concept of the neuron. In the first video, we talked about feedback as a way of starting to build cybernetic systems, that is, systems that through feedback start, a, start to organize and regulate themselves. And here I'd like to introduce the neuron as an idea to bring in some sort of intelligence into the system, a sort of analog AI. The model for a neuron was built along the idea of what's called a perceptron. And this was an idea that I think came around the 60s, but it's a pretty basic idea. So you have a bunch of inputs here, x1, x2, x3, and go. these all go into some mixer, some summation, and the inputs are all attenuated by certain weights. So there's a weight for x1, a weight for x2, and a weight for x3. These inputs, all weighted, are added together and then sent through some sort of nonlinearity. And then you get an output. Now, a couple important things. The nonlinearity just needs to be any sort of nonlinear function. In a lot of the neural network applications and, and algorithms that are used these days, the nonlinearity can be anything from a sigmoid function um, or just uh, what's called rectified linear units. But basically, a lot of them function along the same way, which is that any negative values are just zeroed out and positive values are taken. Um, so the nonlinearity itself is often somewhat unimportant. The idea is that the neuron just has to have this nonlinearity to really be a neuron. Our tools for nonlinearity, as I mentioned last time, are things like comparators and peak and trough modules. The second is the output. Now, in a lot of um, current neural networks, big digital algorithms, this output is used to create some sort of, uh, to test against some sort of goal. Um, the idea of the neural network is it learns to, you know, whatever, tell a picture of a dog from a tree or, or something. And it uses that goal and whether or not it correctly identified the picture to go back and adjust the weights. Now, the nice thing about our purposes is that they're not so strict. Um, as musicians, as artists, we can actually use these things to do human things rather than machine things. We don't have to be making strict judgments about whether or not this neural network has accomplished it, its task because we don't care, we're just exploring. This is in contrast to a lot of the music and arts that have leveraged neural networks over the past decade, which I find really boring because it, they're, they're just sort of using neural networks to uh, create what's already been created and use goalposts and they're basically using the same sort of machine logic that the neural networks of Google and Amazon and whatever use. Here I want to use neural networks actually for human things and with human inputs. Um, again, I recommend the books uh, of Norbert Wiener as a sort of counterpoint to a lot of the neural network and AI talk um, these days in, in big tech companies. But anyway, the point is that we can use these structures for more fun purposes. So why don't we start off by taking some inputs. So let's take uh, one oscillator and we're going to use the CV processor as our mixer. So we'll have these inputs that are summed to the output and we also have attenuators for each of these inputs. So these are going to be the weights. So we'll have this sine wave as one input. We'll have this sine wave as another input. So let's just take these two inputs with these two weights. I'm not even going to move them, but you can see they're kind of, one is at, I don't know, 40%, the other is at negative 50% maybe. And we'll take that output, and let's just use the peak as our nonlinearity, and take the output of the peak into our mixer, and we'll see what that sounds like.
So that's the signal coming from the peak. If we just take the raw, the sum before the nonlinearity, it sounds like this. So you can see that the nonlinearity is actually doing a lot in, in shaping the sound. Um, so let's take that. Maybe let's add another input. Let's add a cycling slope generator. Take the bipolar output and add that in. And we can play around. So as you can see, playing around with the weights and playing around with the inputs themselves really influences the sound. And we can also start to throw in some feedback. Um, and in this sort of diagram of the neuron, I, I, I left the feedback and where it goes to open-ended because, again, we're not necessarily interested in solving some task or accomplishing some goal. We're, we're interested in playing around. Um, so we can take that and take the output and start to route it kind of wherever. So let's just play with uh, where that could go. So if we use the output and go into the input here, that does one thing. How about here? Here. We could also route the output of the peak into itself. It doesn't really do much. Um, we could also take the output and um, if I had some VCAs here, which I don't have in, in this, but I have in some other panels, um, we could use the uh, output to control a VCA, which would, and use that between, use that VCA between the input and the weight. That would kind of be taking the feedback out and adjusting these weights, which is, in fact, how a lot of neural networks work. And in that case, we really start to introduce some sort of intelligence into the system. Let's try a different nonlinearity. So instead of the peak, why don't we take the output of our weighted sum and instead go into a comparator? Now, the comparator output is going to just uh, take the input and compare it against uh, some level. So I could have that level uh, be a different signal, or I can just have it be a DC offset. So if I have it just be this DC offset, maybe let's just take this and go here. What does that sound like? And we can play with DC offset. Given that this comparator is giving us just raw on-off values, it's giving us a square wave, uh, some sort of bizarre square wave rather than what's coming out of the peak, so it's going to be a harsher signal. But we could start to take that and run it through a filter and have some feedback going on the filter like last time or something like that. I also want to try another patch uh, using not audio rate signals but sub audio rate signals. So let's turn these oscillators all the way down. This second oscillator we can put in low frequency mode and let's turn the cycling DSG to a lower um, frequency. So now the output um, is not going to be intelligible as sound uh, because the frequencies are too low. But we're still getting output out of this nonlinearity. Let's, instead of using the peak, let's go into the comparator and use that output to ping the variable Q filter. Um, this is just going to send be sending on-off values and those we're going to use as triggers to just give the filter a ping. So let's speed some of these things up. Or, okay. And we can play with the weights here. We can also use feet. 
back to maybe adjust the frequencies of these oscillators. We also very helpfully, this is uh, the surge uh, divide by M um, model. So this comparator is actually also sent up to this frequency divider. So we can actually divide those fast frequencies uh, anywhere from one up to 32 uh, divisions. So we can get a bit of a slower output. But in this way, we can start to play with this, with all of this, uh, with this neuron acting to just drive this pinging of a filter. And we can, like I said, we can use feedback to change the frequencies of those filters, uh, of, the, of the inputs rather. What if we use the comparator out as well just to So this is another starting point, um, the idea of the neuron. And so in future videos, I'm going to take the neuron, um, start to play even more with intelligence in the system, and start to play more with feedback and kind of adding all these things together to build larger cybernetic systems.